JB Knowledge Podcast Network. On episode 42 of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, talking about AI solutions for commercial insurance with Ron Glossman from Chisel AI. The Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives in specific tech you see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. Back in a second. All right, all right, all right. Another day, another insure tech company to talk with, talk about, talk about all things technology and insurance and all the great stuff that's transforming this industry that we all love. And today with me, I have the illustrious, the Canadian A, Ron Glosman from Chisel AI. Uh, Ron, good to have you on the day joining us from Canada. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, A. Eh? Yeah, eh? Sorry? Let's have some poutine and, and call it a day, eh? <laughs> I, I never understood what people saw in poutine. It's oh. it's not for me, and I think a lot of Canadians will, will say I'm not Canadian for that. But Yeah, they'll, they'll disavow you, huh? It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting deal, Ron. I'm a little out of sorts right now because I usually go to Canada at least two or three times a year. I, I like going to Vancouver. I have some longtime conferences I've been speaking at. In Vancouver, I like going to Toronto and speaking at a couple of conferences there every year. Uh, I generally do the rounds. I hit Calgary, Toronto, uh, Vancouver. I'll go to you know Quebec City. None of that this year. You know, I'm banned. I'm personally prohibited. They don't want me there. Oh wait, no, no, it's because I'm an American. They don't want any Americans there. You're back in Code Red. Code Red. I feel like we're on Star Trek now. Captain, put her in Code Red. You know, like Justin's like exactly put her in Code right. Red. I mean, geez, Louise, you're, you're on your 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 shield, your forward shields maximum, right? <laughs> like you're like we gotta we gotta stop all phaser fire from south of the border, keep all the virus out. So I can't come see you. I can't come hang out in Canada. How are things up there? As winter as winter arrived? It's funny you say that. We had our not our first. It's it's weird because we sort of have thirteen seasons in Canada. I know you've probably heard of four seasons, but we have fourteen here, and one of the seasons is called early, early winter. And then we have late fall and then we have real winter. So it just snowed yesterday. We have a thick, nice covering on the ground, but that was the second snowfall of the year. But I think this one will actually stay. Mm. Well, congrats, I guess. What let the winter sports begin? I mean, in code red, like, do you get to go out on your snowshoes and now your snowmobile? It's funny. I asked somebody the same thing. I'm a, I'm a very avid snowboarder. And I was thinking, you know, chairlifts are six feet apart in some sense, at least when they're going up. So it shouldn't really be a problem. So I hope that they open mountains, but I don't think there's been any official statements. Yeah, well, I hope they do because, uh, man, that would be a shame. I'm a, I'm a skiing guy, you know. Snowboarding involves too much time on my butt. I like, <laughs> I like, I like skiing a whole bunch. But I hope you do get to do your skiing. I know you Canadians, you thrive on winter sports and visits to Florida in the winter. So since you can't do visits to Florida, I hope you at least get your winter sports. We're not going to talk about the weather though. We're going to talk about insurance tech. Before I get started with my interview, don't forget you can subscribe to the Insure Tech Geek podcast if you're listening to this on uh, YouTube or Facebook or any of our live video streams. You can text Geek Out to six six eight six six, and you never miss an episode. So we'll email you the show notes and the links and everything there. Back to Ron Glossman from Chisel AI. That's chisel.ai. Ron, we're going to talk about Chisel and what it does. I'm pretty excited about using machine learning uh, for uh, you know making sure people are actually getting what they bought. You know, and they got the quote. I mean, that's that's really as a, as a consumer of a lot of insurance, I can tell you that's a big pain in my rear end. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm excited about that. We're going to talk about how you're helping underwriting too. Before we do, I want to talk about you. You've got a good story. You're Canadian, which which is cool, right? I mean, you got maple syrup in your blood, <laughs> don't you? And you, so tell me, where did you grow up? What did you dream of doing when you were a kid? Yeah, it's interesting. So I actually immigrated to Canada, which I think is the most Canadian thing. It's very, yeah. I was I think the statistically like. Two thirds of people who live in Canada are immigrants, although I might be wrong, it might be one third, but still, it's quite a large. It's a portion. lot. Yeah. But I came very young and I obviously loved it. And I, from I where? was always told as an immigrant, I came from Israel, from just outside Tel Aviv. And my parents always told me, you got to be a lawyer or a doctor. 
And I think that's a very common joke, but it's, it, it, it actually did happen. And uh, sorry, But they also said that one more option or an entrepreneur. And I think they actually highlighted to me that because I, I would often as a young kid, I would say, look at Bill Gates, look at Steve Jobs. And at the time, it, it was more about money because I thought that was the most important thing. And, and since then, I've learned there's a lot more things that are important than just that. But I said to myself, you know, I want to figure out a problem that I can solve because at the end of the day, that's how you really be really become successful in more ways than one. But I had no problems to solve. And when I was 14, I, I came across sort of my first idea where I said there's a lot of piracy out there in the world. Statistically speaking, 19 out of every song downloads in the Internet uh, in 2000s were uh, illegal. So if they were making billions of dollars on 5% of the market, how much money was out there for the other you know, 19x that they were leaving behind? So I said to myself, what if we do an opportunity where people can listen to music for free and we make ad revenue? And it was pretty successful. We had a couple thousand artists, like about 100,000 users and broke even on the venture. But obviously, we now know Spotify has obviously come in and really dominated that space. But it was a, my first learning opportunity and I learned a lot. And I sat around, went to college at University of Waterloo and Laurier, where I studied computer science and business. And I said, I said to myself, you know, I was sitting there, it was exam season. And I said to myself, it just doesn't make sense that people have to study by reading textbooks because exams are only 10 or 20 pages and the whole textbook is a thousand pages, right? So that's yep. one or 2% of the content. And I said, I think I can teach a computer how to read. Because that seems pretty fun and easy. And so uh, I spent a semester working on it. And I got it to the point where I could stop going to class. I could just you know, take the textbook, run it through the summary app, study for four hours, take the exam and still get an eight. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> then your university found out about it and they made it illegal. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you would think that, but I actually went to them. I tried to pitch them, and they gave me twenty five thousand dollars. Uh, that was that was a good start. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And I also put it out on the App Store, and it, it ended up going viral. In about two weeks, it was in thirty three countries. Forty four of the top Ivy League schools in the world were talking: Princeton, Stanford, Harvard, Yale. Russia, China, India, Brazil, Portugal, Switzerland, Netherlands, like you name it, it was everywhere. And uh, it went on to be named one of the best 50 apps for students of all time. So nice. clearly it had some success. And you wrote and you wrote it 100% yourself? I did at that, at that point, 100%. Yeah. So what'd and, you, what did um, you, what'd you use to write it? I, I'm, I, you know, I'm a nerd, so geek out yeah. with me for a second. So here's the interesting thing. This was, I would say, the first year that uh, textbooks were really in, available in, in PDF format. Not uh, oftentimes, you know, they used to just be print. So having to scan it and have to having to do OCR was a big challenge. So one thing that I got to really leverage on was the ability to read uh, native PDFs. So I didn't have to do OCR. What I started with my as my training corpus was uh, oftentimes when I would read textbooks, I would highlight in yellow the things that I thought were important. And so I would go through and I would use that as actually my training set to say, okay, here are the things that I think are important. I then started to incorporate additional factors. All of it was built in Python. Maybe let me start with that. All of it was built in Python. Um, I used a lot of libraries like obviously Pandas and NumPy. One of the ones that I'm a big fan of that at the time was not very famous, maybe it's well more well-known now, is called Spacey. Yeah, uh, really, really big fan of Spacey, uh, and basically, I ended up building a lot of tools around TFIDF, around you know, lem like tokenizing and stemming and. Uh, you know, word to vec and glove and all of these things. And at the end of the day, I was able to take a textbook and summarize it to one page for every chapter. And then if I wanted to, I could, of course, customize that to be X amount of pages long. Mm, that's awesome. So you did it. You did, you know, you were studying two degrees in two different colleges at the same time. And at the same time, you're you're writing uh, some machine learning algorithms to bypass all the all the, the the liturgy of thousands of pages of reading. You're acing your test. What happened? What you know, something happened, right? You have the entrepreneurial spark. You realize, hey, I should be doing this for money. And uh, what what's the origin story? Yeah. It was very roundabout. As I said, it started as an app for students and I worked on it in that form for about two years. And in early 2016, late 2015, I was invited to a machine learning conference 
where I was asked to present on a panel about natural language processing. And about five minutes after I got off stage, an email came in from our central inbox and it, on our homepage. And it just said, hey, just saw you present. I know this is an app for students, but I think insurance can really benefit. Do you have five minutes to chat? And it ended up being one of the biggest insurance brokerages in the world. I quickly followed up with her. Uh, she you know, was a senior VP there. I said, yes, would love to chat. Met up with her and her team basically six times over the next eight weeks. And at the end of it, they educated me a lot about the types of documents that they read when they're trying to avoid errors and omissions in their operations. And then they said, do you think you can teach a computer to read and do the same job? And I said, yes, I think I can. I think it'll take, you know, six months. We, we negotiated a price at the time. I thought it was, a, it was a crazy killer deal. So I knew that there was a market there, even if I hadn't done the traditional TAM the sizing just yet. And uh, off we went to the races. Off we went to the races, meaning you actually went live with that broker? So we did a POC with them. This is a large multinational broker and we were starting in in Canada. So the next phase was then to go to the US and convince them. And as you know, sometimes that takes a lot longer and requires uh, a lot more manpower and a lot more trips than you can expect. In the meantime, we actually went across the street to their biggest competitor and sold it to them and went live with them. (laughs) (laughs) So the one that gave you the idea wasn't even the first client. Correct. Nice. They technically were the first client. They weren't the first one in production, though. Well, I mean, you could say it's the same thing. That's awesome. So what was the outcome? Because I I like talking about like ROI and outcome when it comes to tech. Right. I've been writing software like you uh, since I was an early tech. I started when I was 11. But I've been writing software a long time. Love talking about tech. Love building tech. But at the end of the day, it can't just be tech for tech's sake. It's got to actually make money for people. So... That the broker that actually went live with it started paying <laughs> those guys. You don't have to say who they are. Just how much money did it? How much money did they spend versus how much did they say? You don't have to give their their spend, but like, you know, how quickly did they make their money back? Was it like two or three months? Was it a two or three weeks? Two or three days? Like, what what, what are they telling you on on ROI and payback? Yeah, it's interesting. It really depends how you cut it. So I'll I'll give you a number. I'll say thirteen months. I also think it really depends how you cut. And I think 30 months is good. I think that's a pretty good ROI on a project. It also, the question is, do you include fixed costs? And I would, in, in, in my sense, fixed costs would be the professional services. You know, when you do B2B enterprise, uh, a little different than B2C, you typically have a services component. So sometimes a services component in year one can be almost as large as the SaaS fee. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't include that, the ROI is much faster. But if you are including that, it's typically like 13 months. And so what that means is that can literally be like 10 times cheaper than it actually costs them today. 10 times cheaper than it costs today. So just as an example, then it costs for them cost- to do it manually today because they're doing this. They're doing they're doing this review. And in this particular case, you're making sure that what was quoted is what was bound, right? So you're exactly. you're reading the quote, and then you're reading the binder, and then you're comparing them, and you're looking for additions, uh, additions and exclusions, additions and removals, which happens all the time. It drives people. Yeah. It drives people crazy. It also makes people look dishonest, right? Right. Uh, like, hey, this is not what you quoted me. So they're doing manual review. They go to doing automatic review. I'm, I'm guessing they do just some manual double checking on top of that. But the the total labor savings are huge, right? That's that's right. Like we're talking eighty percent, like in the range of eighty percent. Incredible, incredible. What year was that first go live? Oh my god! Well, it took a long. I would say officially, the first go live was at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Yeah, so, so we're you, coming up on two years now. Yeah, you're coming up on two years. So how has the account expansion gone? Yeah, it's interesting. We since then we've had a new client come in who's been even bigger, and uh, you know I think this one's a little more public, so I can talk about it. We we won the Zurich Innovation World Championship last year, the inaugural year. Nice. Uh, and, and fun fact, I'm not a big golf fan, but for those of you that are, Zerk hosts or sponsors one of the big golf tournaments, and they keep the trophy for it. And uh, Tiger Woods is one of the trophy holders, and my trophy from the Zerk World Cup sits right right next to his in their main office in Switzerland. So, that is awesome. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Uh, 
Anyways, back to the story. So Zerk's been very public about the relationship with us. That is one of our, you know, most sort of favorable relationships, one of our largest accounts. So I, th- I would say you learn a lot. Obviously, the first customers, I was talking a little bit about mistakes. Like the first customers are the ones who you learn a lot from. And sometimes you make mistakes with them that you live and you get better from. And sometimes it just takes them time to see you in a different light. And so sometimes the expansion can be faster with other customers. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So where have you evolved to? Because you're not just doing machine learning review of binders to quotes. Now you've dive you you've taken a dive into the deep end of the pool with underwriting, correct? That's right. The deep end. That sounds so scary. But it is the deep end. Underwriting is a big, deep, scary place. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and this I think that's interesting because it's I would say it's not a deep end of a pool, but it's like Mariana's trench. Like there are so <laughs> many levels to this. <laughs> and oftentimes as a startup, even as investors or even with customers, it's hard to differentiate and they'll be like, Well, there's a million people who do this. And it's like, well, not really, because like there's levels. There's deep there's levels to this. But yes, so what we're starting to do now is focus on the clearance and registration piece of underwriting. And so the interesting thing is when we look at underwriting, there's depending how minute and granular you want to be, fifteen, twenty three or forty two touch points. You can probably get even more than that, but at least in our analyses, we've been able to get those numbers. So when we think through that, one of the very first things that need to happen, and it's one of the most pivotal things and the things that companies have the worst turnaround time on, is clearance and registration. And what I mean when I say clearance registration is typically three things need to happen. An application or a submission comes in from a broker or or some other method. Sometimes it can be through a portal if it's still a PDF. And what typically happens is there's a queue. So it sits there for three to five days until some type of customer service representative or underwriting assistant can get to it. Their job is to look at the submission and just do simple data entry, like get into our CRM, get it into our clearance and registration system to check for sanctions and get it into, you know, let's say our quoting engine for some, some other reason. The other thing that they do is they also try to decline the business. So if they see things like, oh, these guys have like 20 claims in the last five years, that might not be a risk appetite. And so that determination can take time. And it also has a lot of mistakes. And so the very, very first thing that we focus on is just getting the information out from those applications into your traditional systems. So it's meant to work with your guide wire system, yeah. your sales force, whatever it might be. So you, it's meant you, to just you, automate data entry. So you'd use an RPA for that? It's a lot more complex than RPA because here's the thing. A lot of these carriers will work with more than 3,000 brokerages and agencies, all of which have a different format. Not yep. everybody's using <laughs> you, a board. Yeah. Don't you love it? It's like it's like an IT, it's, it's like a technology dream because it's the it's a gigantic colossal problem right it's an incredible amount of inefficiency and absolutely no standards it it like it screams out machine learning right that's right it's and that's the thing like with rpa and it's also interesting because there's there's some rpa bots that have machine learning built in that do a really good job of adapting though but that's right. And I think also the interesting thing is if you look at the sort of distribution of the problem, most of your business probably only comes from a handful of those brokerages and agencies. And so even if you tackle the the the, the head, it typically has a short head and a very long tail. Yeah. But that short head is very fat. You might be able to solve 60, 70, 80 percent of the problem by solving 10, 20 or 30 different file types. So RPA can definitely leverage the problem on the, on the small scale. But when you get to really, really big problems, it doesn't quite solve the problem the way we do how do you do it oh baby like we have a pipeline it's like it's not like one piece of code it's like it's very like don't <laughs> you don't just co- so- you don't just copy and paste code off of a uh, form stack or something <laughs> I mean, you definitely do stack overflow. <laughs> you definitely do, but uh, that's a small piece of it. No, I mean, I won't go into necessarily the super super saucy stuff, but I'll go. Maybe you don't have to. You can keep it at 50, you can keep it at fifty thousand feet. I yeah. mean, this is because uh, I, I feel like we don't get enough time to talk about this. Like, we, we I, I get it. I understand what you're. So first off, you're trying to you're trying to make sure that forms are complete, right? That has to be step number one. Like an application. In that, in that, the, the the first check is this application even complete? It's it, interestingly enough. Yes, the answer is yes, sort of, but it doesn't take any action. It just says the application is incomplete. Yeah, it just lets and them know. That, it, it didn't it kick. It didn't know. kick it back. 
Kick it back, yeah. It does not kick it back to the applicant. It, it just no. it, it just it just lets the 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 initial person dealing with it know that it's incomplete. Correct, and obviously, like that's a configuration thing. It's very easy to write software that says once this flag is triggered, you know, send an email. But no, so basically, the goal is that the emails come into a centralized inbox or something else. The inbox is constantly pulled, sort of like a webhook. It's constantly monitored. As applications come in, the first thing you do is you read the email body. That's one piece of data. You extract some information from there. Typically, let's say the the name, the email of the broker, the name of the applicant, and the date that they need the response by. Then you need to look at all of the attachments. And on average, there's three to seven attachments. I've seen as many as 33. So then you need to take each one of those attachments. It can be Word files, Excel, PDF. And each file has to have its own parser or its own model or pipeline that it goes through to be read. So you run each one of those, you extract different data points, and then you need to know, like, you know, let's say there's conflicting information. Like this says this is the phone number, this says this is the phone number, which one takes precedence? Yeah. And so like it's a deep, deep, like it's I call it a cake. There's levels, many, many layers to it. But it's the fifty thousand foot view of how you do it. That's awesome. So what what's the market reaction now? Like, is it, oh my gosh, I have to have this now? Or are there still a lot of people that don't understand what you're doing? Education is definitely a... I would say now it's different. The education that we had, you know, four years ago was a lot about like, what is AI? How can I trust it? And a lot of preliminary education pieces around what is AI, what is technology. Now the conversations are a lot about how are you different than your competitors? Educate me on how you're different. So they're no longer saying, is AI the right solution? You know, what is AI? Is it safe? But they're saying, how are you different? So now we have to... And back then, I would say we were the only vendor. And nowadays, I still think we're the only vendor in specifically what we do. But on the surface... (laughs) Everybody thinks that, by the way. We don't don't exactly have a head-to-head competitor. Yes, you do. Right? Like everybody does. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) of course. And uh, there's a couple that come to mind. But I would say a lot of the education nowadays is, is more about competitor versus like what is AI and how does it work. Yeah, gotcha. That's awesome. So what's next? We want to build more applications, and I think we we have a couple of really interesting areas that we want to work on next. And these applications are, I would say, today we're very much in laying the like the plumbing or the groundwork for uh, being able to do cool things downstream. So right now, as we talked about, it's a lot about making sure the data exists, making sure the data is clean, making sure the data is valid, making sure the data is in the right place. Once you've cracked that nut, and I would say a lot of companies need that nut cracked, and nobody has. You know, or people are still working on cracking, cracking the nut. Once you get that done, you can move on to really cool things like what Amazon's amazingly good at, which is like, what do other consumers like you buy? Like, imagine an insurance company that could have the recommendation engine. And so that that capability is something that I would love to, you know, have a part in building. And I think it, the first person to, to be able to do that will reap the benefits. And I think Amazon is also trying to do that. I read in the US, if you're not buying drugs, like pharmaceutical drugs with insurance, you can get it at a deep discount on Amazon Prime. Yeah, well, there's, there. you know, we, we have a very complicated medical market here, but Amazon is jumping in headfirst into all kinds of segments of it. And of course, Walgreens and, and CVS are as well. You know, pretty direct medical care. Uh, so it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty different world that's coming up. Yeah. That's great, man. Well, look, let's just, kind of the last thing, where do you think machine learning, learning is going? Is this, is this replacing humans or, or augmenting them and making them better? Or a little bit of both? Both and like even more, like it's also the creating new jobs, like data science jobs are some of the most in demand and highest paying jobs that people can really get. And there you even go. coming out of college, right? So it's like it's a complex question. I, I liken it to like the industrial revolution, where you know a lot of people used to be employed in the agriculture industry, and nowadays four percent of people feed ninety six percent of the population. And so I think we have sort of a similar thing where we'll be able to reap the benefits, we'll be able to have better lives. Hopefully, in some sense, I'm hoping work, you know, less. So one of our company missions or our company mission, our company saying is work smart and enrich lives. It used to be work smart, not hard. But uh, we decided to change it because, you know, 
not not a great saying in the sense you know you should still work smart and hard. Yeah, no, right. I I I I, <laughs> I I learned that a long time ago. I started my company when I was twenty one. I remember when I was twenty five and running a tech company. Right, it's it's been 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 a while. I'm forty one now, but I used I, I I used to always correct people when they would say work smart not hard. I would say how about work smart and hard because right. You know, like we we should work hard every day. It doesn't mean you have to work long hours. You just have to work hard during the hours we're working, right? And, and that's right. And 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 that's that's to me that's actually the biggest promise of AI and machine learning is allowing us to keep working a good hard eight hour a day, but to get a lot more accomplished, drive output up, drive productivity up, which drives you know earnings. And and you 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 said exactly the jobs that are getting created by machine learning pay way way more because they add a lot more value. And and if you look at just over in we're, we're functionally in what the, the third industrial revolution right I mean the first one started two hundred years ago each time unemployment net aggregate unemployment's gone down and wages have gone up and and, and that's net of inflation right so like just raw wages and then, and we're, we we work fifty percent fewer hours than our great grandparents did on average and that came from automation and and so when you look at that I mean the the five day work week is less than hundred years old automation. There's a lot of things that came from automation. There's there was certainly legislative reform that came along with it, but that legislative reform wouldn't have been possible without productivity gains made by 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 the industrial revolution. And 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 to me, this is the third wave, right? This is digital industrial revolution. Although there's still you know rapid changes and improvements being made in, in raw manufacturing. I was mm-hmm. looking at some videos of some some modern car manufacturing facilities, and they are absolutely science fiction brought to real life when you see them going on, you know. And then you watch uh, you watch SpaceX launch their Crew Dragon capsule, a Canadian who went to South Africa and then back to Canada and then came down to the promised land here in, in the U.S. Elon Musk? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. Good. Yeah. 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 Well, know that. Yeah. His, his Canadian family. A very adventurous Canadian family who decided to go live in South Africa for a while, and then he came back to Canada first. <clears throat> didn't like the job opportunities he had, so came down to the United States. Then you know applied to Stanford, never enrolled, and never actually enrolled at Stanford. And uh, it's it's just uh, it's amazing to me how much value has been added to humanity through engineering. Like it, it I, I honestly get a little emotional about it. I'll be straight, like. You and I, you and I share a lot, of, a lot in common. You know, I, I did anything I could in college to try and game the system. Right, I, I was honest. I didn't cheat, but I, I remember doing side projects for clients because I started my business when I was in school, and I would go to my professors and get them to let it count as my work for the class. And and like I, I, I got in really big trouble my junior year. I was in, I was in ROTC. I was a, I was a Navy midshipman, so I was in the military college portion of Texas A and M, and I got in a lot of trouble my junior year for this event that we weren't supposed to do and we did anyway. <laughs> and, and, you know, I got a rebellious streak in me and, and I was the senior ranking, I was the senior ranking junior on the scene. And so they came down hard on me. And so I went to the head of discipline discipline and I said, I noticed that you're tracking all of the disciplinary items on um, paper. I said, would you like to automate that so you can automatically know how much you know, how many penalties have to be assessed on people? And he goes, yeah, that'd be great. I said, okay, how about I build that system for you and you let me out of my restricted weekends where I can't go anywhere? <laughs> and he's like, deal. And I was like, this is awesome. I mean, it just, it, it's just so, it's just so funny. And, and but, but the really cool thing is every one of those projects that you work on when you, you know, and I'm sure you've worked on a, I, I looked at your resume. I mean, you, you had, you had jobs all through college. All those projects add so much value in whatever whatever field they're applied, and you look at this, the big problem that you solve to me when I when I, I got really excited when you agreed to do our, our show because it's that you're helping people actually be properly insured. This is literally one of the biggest problems facing people who buy insurance is that what they think they're buying is rarely what they actually get bound on, and you've you fun, functionally fixed it. <laughs> and that's right. and that's my so it's like you have this big moral good and then you have this big business good right and the brokers save a lot of money the carriers save reputation and face at the end of the day they really do whether they believe it or not right and 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 most importantly the person buying insurance has the coverage they needed yep and and to to the question that sort of kickstarted this 
do I think it's going to impact jobs? I think the interesting thing, here's what I've seen. There was a gentleman, you know, one of our early customers that I went in and I did a, a time study and I shadowed him for a day to see what a day in the life of a broker is like, you know, riveting stuff. And it actually was actually very exciting. And I said to him, you know, tell me about your day. And he goes, I usually come in, start around 7 or 8 a.m. and I'll leave the office around 7 or 8 p.m. And I go, holy cow, like, why do you work 12 hour days? And he goes, I need to check four policies a day. And when the policies take two hours each, that's a good day. And when, pol when policies take four hours each, that's a bad day. But I need to check four every day. And so by helping reduce the amount of policy, the amount of time it takes him to check policies, you know, my vision is he's going to get time back in his day so that he doesn't have to work extra hours. He gets to go home to his wife uh, or to his partner, have a great dinner, go to that baseball game with his kids, whatever it might be. And so I think that's also another aspect of sort of the greater good. It's not always about taking away jobs. You know, yeah, yeah. I, it's never in, in all the discussions I've had with every technology company I've been involved with and every piece of code I've ever built. We never say, how can we eliminate jobs? I've been doing this 20 years, man. I've been writing code for 30. I've never uttered those words. That's right. I love that. And because that's not what it's about. I, I like people, man. I, I'm not an introvert. I'm not like a, a hermit. Uh, <laughs> I, I like hanging out with people. I like humans. I want people to be able to do things that, that matter. And mm -hmm. I think you do too. Like, all right, would you rather have a job? Okay, all right, you didn't even, in college, you didn't even want to sit down and read the textbook because you knew how pointless it was, right? And so imagine these poor people who have to just sit there and just read this volumes of documents, just making sure somebody didn't screw up a binder. That's right. And it's like, that. there's more to life than that. You don't want people sitting in a job going, there's more to life than this job. Like, you want to say, this is fulfilling professional work, Right. Yep. So that's what I say when I go to write code is how can we build something not that eliminates jobs, but that eliminates meaningless work and allows those people to do meaningful things for those companies, you know, and I think that unfortunately, there's people out there who really hate technology. And you know this. <laughs> You're 25. You've been that's on this right. earth long enough. You've been a quarter of a century. You you know you've been, you've run into them right they just they they say it's evil it's eliminating jobs and and we got to tax it i mean crazy stuff like taxing robots and stuff like like come on what are you talking about <laughs> this, it's, this, this it doesn't even make sense no i'm with you and i think one of the interesting things that i don't know i'm still i'm i haven't formed my opinion but i think one thing that technology could enable is like a universal basic income. I don't know if that's good or bad. I haven't gathered enough, enough data to make my decision yet. But I think definitely technology could get to the point where machines could provide for us and we could all have a rather good quality of life without having to do work. And I think the interesting thing there is that should hopefully allow us to pursue more creative and artistic endeavors. If, you know, you've always wanted to be a painter or let's say like I personally like photography, I don't really have time to do photography and it doesn't really make me money. So I don't take time off my job to do it because I still got to pay my bills. But, you know, hypothetically, if, if, you know, there's less work and I only work half the time or one quarter of the time and I still make a salary just as good, then I can spend the rest of my time doing my creative endeavors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I've got really strong feelings about UBI. It's it's the same old idea that's been re, that's been rehashed for the last 200 years and it, and it just never really works out well. And, and so I, you know, because people, you have moral hazard, right? Moral hazard is a, is a really big topic that you got to think about. And when you incentivize people to do nothing, it turns out a lot of people to take you up on it. They're like, cool, I'm going to do nothing. And, and then, you know, product, right. pro product, productivity and output bottoms out. And so like you can go through, we can go through 20, 20, 20 papers. We can go through 200 years of, of history on this. And it, 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 yeah, but, but it's really not, it's really, it's really not, uh, <laughs> not central to our argument today. <laughs> what I am excited about is that your technology is changing lives and is helping people to buy insurance. So, Good, good on you for this. We've talked about like what, what's the next big release that you guys have coming that you're really excited about. Just to wrap it up, <clears throat> it's funny you say that. It's uh, actually something we're going to call quote compare. So in the same vein as like 
even up front, it's like, which one of these is going to be the best uh, to meet my needs? Because oftentimes uh, they'll offer a lower coverage than you're asking for in terms of a limit or the deductible might be higher. And there's sort of these little gotchas that make it really hard to read insurance policies. And on the personal line side, we're probably all familiar with like, you know, Geico and all of those different companies. But on the on the commercial side, there isn't really anything that does that. So it's a tool that we're currently working on. We have a an MVP of, and we hope to bring to market in Q1. You're going to tackle work comp? Yeah, that's actually the one of the main lines that we start with. All right. Sure. Well, I expect a phone call later. We're gonna have to... <laughs> All right. I've spent the last uh, 15 years in work comp, so we're going to talk about work comp software all day long. Love it. Listen, I would love your input. That yeah. Like you, know, you have a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I've been, been, I've been building work comp software a long time. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating... You know, work comp is one of the one of the more challenging lines in general because you have, you know, these indemnity payments and you have all this medical stuff and you're like, you just have so much to do with medical and it makes it really complicated. It really does. You're dealing with people and when they get back to work and, it, and it, it's, it, it's really, really challenging. Very, very tight. You know, and of course the United States really complicates it because we have a different regulatory system for every state. And um, so you really have 50 countries here and uh, you know, from an IT perspective, it, you know, there's part of me that's thankful for it because it creates a lot of work for technology companies. But the other part of it, yep. I'd really like to fix the problem. I, I'd rather work on other stuff. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I'd rather fix other problems other than having to constantly update 50 regulatory charts. You know, but it's but but it is what it is. I mean, there's uh, there there's a lot of opportunity there to to automate things and and, and quote comparison would be really cool to actually be able to side by side Mm -hmm. and catch because you know where you get really caught up in quote comparison is the exclusions and Mm -hmm. and in in particular like if you were able to tackle cyber and that and that would be one of the harder ones and i'm sure you've got a cyber policy and i do too because we're tech companies right cyber gets really dicey because they often include you know and the exclusions get really, really f- finite, minute gotchas. You know, you can get in big trouble in cyber with the exclusions and with work comp. So for I'm, sure, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm eager. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see how you handle it. That's that's actually what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I mean, let's well, let's chat offline. I'm I'm happy to set something up. I mean, it's definitely, and that's part of the complexity. And that's the interesting thing is. You know, I mentioned we've we've looked at depending on how granular there's a variety of different touch points to work on. We've known about quote comparison for three or four years, but the reason we haven't built it to date is part of it is the complexity that you just highlighted. So you can only imagine what that means the other fourteen mean if we're doing this as the third one. <laughs> yeah, right. That's awesome. Man, I enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. We've had we've had a bunch of Israeli entrepreneurs on here. You're an Israeli Canadian entrepreneur, so I'm digging that. I'm digging it. It's yeah. like it's like the best of two great countries. I love Israel, love Canada. I love the entrepreneurial spirit in both places. It's really really exciting. I'm fired up for you and and the product that you're building and obviously you've raised a bunch of money, so congratulations on that. And uh, you know, just uh, hold on to your dream, keep chasing it down and and certainly we'll we'll follow up with you as you keep uh, blowing it up. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you so much and I, I will say, you know, I, I'm a sole founder, but I have to give it to the team. It wouldn't be possible without, you know, the many people that support me. So I, I can't take all the credit for all those wonderful things you said. I just have to throw it in. Uh, I have to throw in the team as well. Good, good leader credits this team, and I appreciate that. I, I've got 230 amazing people behind me that just absolutely do a great job every day for us here at JB Knowledge, and I'm I'm thankful, thoroughly thankful for them, and I'm thankful for your team too because they're helping improve the insurance industry. And so, you and I get to talk on the on the on the video cameras, but they're the ones you know make, making the magic happen. So, uh, a big kudos to your team, and uh, a, a big thanks to you for joining us today. Thanks for all of our listeners out there in listener land. For joining us, that's right, for the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by Jimmy Knowledge at jimmyknowledge.com. It's all about technology that's transforming and disrupting, in a very good way, the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham. Big thanks to Jim Greenlee, our podcast producer, Kara Daltonara, our creative producer, and Adele Waldeck, our transcriptionist. And thank you for joining us today. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out.